Um, and I think this distinction is something that um, reflects the, the, the rather different experimental approaches that have been taken to studying these two aspects. Um, and it'll be a useful distinction for us to, to keep in mind. So I, I'm talking here about regulation. And um, in the bacterial context, regulation um, seems to take place without the utilization of external sources of energy. Um, energy is required to bind and unbind, but it's borrowed from the thermal bath in which um, the components sit. In contrast, in eukaryotes, we can list a number of different sources of energy expenditure, some of which are in fact listed there. Um, and these all require the presence behind the scenes, as it were, in, in the sense that they're not explicitly represented in these diagrams, um, of, of various forms of chemical potential, or if you like, a chemical battery, if you like ATP and phosphate in the background. And this battery is continually recharged by metabolic processes within the cell. And if it were not for those batteries, um, these systems would simply come to a grinding halt. So there's continual external expenditure of energy. And, and the question is, is this just um, another molecular phenomenon like any other form of enzymatic catalysis, which is, I have to say, pretty much how it's treated um, in the context of uh, studies of gene regulation, experimental studies, um, or is there something more fundamental going on here? So this is the question that we want to, to address. And I think a very good starting point for this is um, this um, paper of John Hopfield's, um, which uh, goes back to the 1970s now. Um, uh, it's his famous paper on kinetic proofreading. And I say famous because every molecular biologist you speak to will know what kinetic proofreading is, or they will know of this paper. Um, uh, I have to say, I, I, I was recommended to read this when I first came to biology. Um, and it took me about 10 years to understand what he was saying. Um, so uh, what was Hopfield saying? And I think he was saying something very significant and important. Um, and um, uh, I've tried to capture it in this sort of elevator slogan. Um, when I want to explain this in class, this is what I tell people Hopfield was telling us. Um, uh, and he was telling us uh, to take two bites of the cherry. And what does this mean? So he was interested in, at the time, um, trying to explain um, the extraordinarily low error rates in macromolecular synthesis, the production of uh, the, the um, replication of DNA, transcription of um, uh, RNAs. Um, and uh, the numbers that were coming out uh, from the first experimental studies were um, an error in ev one in every 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 nucleotides, which was remarkable. And Hopfield was trying to understand this. And um, uh, his argument, and, and I've extricated the language, the um, descriptive language he used, um, uh, so that you can see. Um, but I, I've then uh, converted that into the language we're going to start using over the course of this talk, um, which is this more graphical language, which is shown at the bottom. And, and that will be quite important for us. So, Hopfield is formulating this as a problem of discrimination. Um, <clears throat> there are two um, um, substrates, a correct substrate, C, and an incorrect substrate, X. And we're trying to design a, a, a biochemistry, a biochemical mechanism that will distinguish C from X. And, and he's, Hopfield is formulating this as a uh, quantitatively as um, measure, trying to, to determine the error ratio. And the error ratio is the probability at steady state of detecting C, the correct substrate. So, uh, let me rephrase that. It's the ratio of the probability of detecting the incorrect substrate, X, to the probability of detecting the correct substrate, C. When I say probability here, I mean probability at steady state. So, Hopfield is imagining this biochemical mechanism operating at steady state. Um, and he's using this error ratio as a way to understand discrimination. And the first uh, way that something is discriminated in biology is, is through binding. Um, and typically through the off rate of binding, the, the correct substrate basically stays bound for longer, or the incorrect substrate has a higher off rate. Um, and what Hopfield said was, well, um, suppose we get a certain error ratio with one binding, which is, is illustrated on the, on the, on, on the left. Um, and it's not difficult to work out from the numbers that were available what kind of error ratio you would get. 
and the number was about one in ten to the four uh, from Hopfield's calculation, back of the envelope calculation. And and so what he's telling us, well, why not take two bites of the cherry instead of binding once, we can bind whoops twice, um, and that's shown on the right. Um, so uh, we we can have one binding, which is if you like going from state zero to state e. Or you can have two bindings going from zero to one, that's one binding, going from one to E, and E offers the chance of a second binding. So if you get an error of, um, say, epsilon with the first binding, an error of epsilon with the second, uh, you should get a net, net error, overall error, of epsilon squared. And um, that would get you to one in 10 to the eight. Um, and it seems fine. What's the problem? And why do you need energy expenditure? And um, thereby hangs the thread on which much of the rest of the talk will will rest. Um, so one of the things as a mathematician um, uh, um, I have to confess is that you know I, I didn't learn my physics properly and it took me quite a while to understand that um, something that is obvious to physicists which is that there are in fact two kinds of steady state and they're shown here in, in this diagram. There's a state of thermodynamic equilibrium which um, represented by the by the water in the sink where there's no input and no output and therefore the level of water is steady um, and the possibility that there is input and output um, but yet um, they can come into balance and therefore uh, again we can get a steady state in which the height of the water in the sink doesn't change um, and the, 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 the illustration on the left is a system at thermodynamic equilibrium and the illustration on the right is a system away from thermodynamic equilibrium and at thermodynamic equilibrium, amazing things happen, and uh, um, they are listed there. They're known under different names, detailed balance, microscopic reversibility. Um, a, a more familiar way to, 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 to say it is that if we were to take a, a movie of the microscopic uh, dynamics of the molecules, we couldn't tell if they were going forwards or back, if the movie was going forwards or backwards. Um, uh, there's no notion of, there's no sense of time. Whereas away from equilibrium, there is an arrow of time. Now, another way to say this, which I think is particularly helpful for us because it, it illustrates Hopfield's idea, is that at, um, uh, if we come back to the diagram that we had previously, is that at thermodynamic equilibrium, um, you can't tell what path you followed. Meaning that if you want to calculate the steady state probability of um, the correct or the incorrect substrate, that probability doesn't depend on the path that the system took to get to that state. That's path independence. And it's a restatement of detailed balance of microscopic reversibility in the context of this graph-like way of, of representing things. Um, the only way to, to get out of this um, dilemma um, is to expend energy to take the system away from thermodynamic equilibrium. And if you do this, the steady state probability of the, uh, uh, of the exit state becomes dependent on the path that you take through the graph. So the system can tell whether you took one bite of the cherry or two. And then the, the cleverness behind Hopfield's calculation is to determine the uh, the parametric conditions under which, in fact, you do get an improvement in the error ratio over what you would get at thermodynamic equilibrium. And just to elaborate a little bit in this graph theoretical language that I've introduced, um, uh, this is the sort of setup that Hopfield did, sort of uh, reinterpreted into this language. Um, we have the correct substrate um, uh, the mechanism for that on the right, the incorrect substrate on the on the left, the discrimination in these in these graphs is purely through the off rates. So the off rate for correct binding in, for incorrect binding is higher by a multiple, uh, which is greater than one, um, of the off rate for the correct substrate. Um, and um, you can show that the error ratio in this case it's always less than the equilibrium ratio, the ratio at equilibrium squared. Um, but you can find parametric conditions where it's strictly greater than the um, error ratio, uh, uh, equilibrium error ratio. Um, so, so this is Hopfield discrimination. Um, and um, as I said, it's uh, an extremely well-known paper in the sense that all biologists know about kinetic proofreading. But I think um, 
Hopfer was saying something very much more profound than just the particular application here. And our sort of gloss on what Hopfield was trying to tell us is summarized on this slide here. Um, he was basically, I think, um, uh, telling us something which, which perhaps to physicists is obvious, but I have to say to molecular biologists and to ignorant mathematicians like me, definitely not obvious. Um, and it's this, um, uh, suppose you have any information processing task. It needn't be um, you know, DNA replication. It needn't be discrimination. It could be you know, um, amplification, which is something we're going to think about later. It could be um, classification. It could be learning. It could be, it doesn't matter. Whatever your favorite information processing task is, then um, uh, if the mechanism that's implementing that is operating at thermodynamic equilibrium, there is a fundamental upper bound to how well it can do that. And that bound is set by physics, it's set by detail bounds. And it doesn't matter how complicated the mechanism is, it's never going to exceed that, do better than that. The only way to get beyond this hot field barrier is to expend energy, take the system away from thermodynamic equilibrium. And in the, in the context of uh, you know, hot field's discrimination, he, he makes the argument that if you put enough energy into it, you can make the error ratio as, as small as you like. Um, and um, you know, uh, is that true for other information processing tasks? That's not so clear, but um, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the kind of question you begin to ask once you take this perspective. As you get beyond the Hopfield barrier, you have to worry about lots of other things. And one of the things Hopfield didn't worry about is that indeed you can make the error ratio as low as you like, but you take more and more time to do it. And um, you really don't want a mechanism that does that. You want a mechanism that is both uh, correcting errors, but doing it pretty quickly. And if you think about how, um, how fast uh, RNA polymerase and DNA polymerase are, they move at, at many, many nucleotides per second. Um, they don't hang around. Um, then um, you need to balance the fact that you're being accurate with the fact that you're also being um, fast. So, so there are issues of trade-offs when you get beyond uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. So this is the idea of, uh, of a Hopfield barrier. And what we want to, to, to begin to think about is um, uh, the nature of the, the, these Hopfield barriers in various kinds of information processing tasks. So following the energy for us is, is a strategy for thinking or rethinking molecular biology from this perspective of how energy is being used. Okay, so, um, so, so that was background for um, following the energy. And let me now move on to, to talking about how we're going to, to approach this problem. And I, I've sort of set the scene a little bit in terms of introducing this, this, this sort of graph-like uh, descriptive language for thinking about these things. Okay, so when we start to, to build models of biological systems, um, uh, you know, uh, most of uh, uh, our, our experience with this um, is inherited from physics and from engineering. And, and um, in those fields, um, it is very natural to think of the models that we make as descriptions of reality. And if we think about quantum mechanics, we think we're actually describing the quantum world with the equations that we write down there. Um, and, um, and, and it's quite natural to, to bring that viewpoint into biology. Um, and I think this actually is rather dangerous because um, the problem is that when we work in biology, we don't start from Schrodinger's equation and create our models. Uh, our models are phenomenological. Um, and I would argue, and uh, you know, when I teach uh, systems biology, this is what I do argue, um, that um, the models we make in biology are not descriptions of reality, and it's a mistake to think they are. Um, and uh, what are they in that case? And, and I think the person who said this most beautifully um, is the pharmacologist James Black, illustrated there. Um, uh, and um, if you've ever taken a beta blocker or uh, known anyone who did, you have him to thank. Um, and um, uh, uh, although um, those of us who come from physics and mathematics don't realize this, ma many of the really important ways in which uh, mathematics has been used in biology has actually been developed, have, have actually been developed by biologists. And James Black was an example of this, he used models to study pharmacology to develop uh, the beta blockers, in fact. And uh, he, uh, he clarified the role that these models played in uh, the language that you can read on that slide. And, um, uh, and, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to describe it. Um, they are not descriptions of reality. They are rather 
uh, descriptions, they're accurate descriptions of our pathetic thinking about nature. Um, and, and this was the title of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an article, um, one of these commentaries that Rob um, kindly mentioned earlier, um, in which this idea is, is expanded. Um, uh, and I think there are many things that follow from this, and one can have all sorts of philosophical arguments about whether this is the right way to think or not, uh, which will be fun. But, um, um, but, but I take uh, one of the morals of this um, to be um, the following, that we have to be very transparent in the assumptions that we make about, um, ab about our models. Because ultimately, if the models are not a description of reality, um, and are really descriptions of our assumptions, then every time we're using them, we're really testing our assumptions. So there is a strong uh, sense in which uh, we would all like um, uh, biology to become, as we say, more predictive. And again, that's again an analogy with what we know in physics and engineering. Um, and uh, to me, I'm always cautious about that, uh, uh, you know, sort of hanging our hook on prediction because, um, uh, to me, uh, if a models are descriptions of our assumptions, then what we're doing is testing our assumptions, not making predictions. So, um, I, so I think the onus on us is to be very transparent about our assumptions and not sort of pretend that keep them hidden and say, oh, we're making predictions. I think that can be dangerous. Okay, so with that, um, um, uh, let me t say something about the, the, the kind of approach that we're going to take. Um, uh, and uh, I think for this, it's uh, 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 helpful, uh, as I said, to be transparent about our assumptions. So let's think about building models of gene regulation. Okay. Um, so, so there are two sets of assumptions. And I would say that the first set are the sort of background assumptions, the sort of things that you know, we, 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 have to, um, we have to assume because we don't really know how to do it any other way. Um, and then there's sort of foreground assumptions, which you can sort of take or leave depending on the problem you're looking at. So the background assumptions. So, so, so um, what determines, uh, what information determines whether or how a gene is expressed? Um, well, um, you know, traditionally we, we, we divide this into two parts. There's information which we, um, in the uh, language of biology, we say is in cis meaning it's present in the sequence, DNA sequences uh, near that gene, um, in regions that are called promoters, if they're close to the start site of the gene or enhancers if they're far away. Um, but there's also information in trans, which is in the shape of the actual proteins called transcription factors, which bind to those sites. Fine, but, but what determines uh, the levels of the transcription factors? Well, they also are expressed from genes and they too have promoters and enhancers. And, um, and it's not just that the transcription factor is expressed, but it actually has to be in the nucleus and it has to be activated, um, which may depend on uh, kinases that phosphorylate it, which also have their own uh, promoters and enhancers. And if you start chasing your tail like this, um, you realize that what determines how any single gene is expressed is actually the whole genome and the whole cell. So uh, this is not surprising. Um, all life has this recursive structure in which genotype creates phenotype, which determines how the genotype is expressed. Um, uh, but it's very difficult to, um, to, to uh, model the whole cell to determine how a single gene is working. Um, so what we do is uh, we say, no, forget that. Um, we cut the connections. We basically uh, mathematically remove uh, the, the, the recursion um, and, and we consider uh, a gene to be uh, represented by a function between uh, the transcription factors, which are inputs, um, and the output to the gene. So we, we, we take that recursive system, we sort of basically surgically remove the things that we think we are most important, uh, and we consider that in isolation. Um, and um, uh, this is the gene regulation function. And uh, an example is shown there. This is taken from the experimental literature. This is Drosophila, um, a particular gene, hunchback is being uh, image there in response to uh, a transcription factor that is actually in, comes comes from um, the mother. It's a maternal transcription factor called picoid, um, and um, um, some careful experimental measurements give us uh, the curve that you see on the right there, which is an instantiation of this idea of a gene regulation function. The thing to keep in mind is 
that's all very well, but there are some very, very major assumptions involved in cutting the loop in this way and extricating this part of the system from the larger uh, living cell that it's part of. Um, uh, in particular, we tend to think of the transcription factors uh, as, um, uh, as um, things that um, you know, we can treat almost like parameters uh, and move around. Um, whereas in fact, they're things that are determined by the cell. So, so there are implications for this, okay? So these are some of the sort of background assumptions that we make in starting to think about genes. But there's also a set of um, uh, foreground assumptions, if you like, rather than background assumptions, which um, become necessary when you want to sort of get down to brass tacks here. Um, and uh, I've listed some of them there. Um, we make this time scale separation, which was implicit in Hopfield's treatment of his Hopfield barrier, which is that the regulatory system is operating at steady state. Um, and that's an enormous convenience because uh, steady states are much easier to deal with than transient regimes. Now, you know, we could dispense with this, we could get into the transient dynamics, but we choose not to in this case. Um, we've, I've already mentioned this separation of regulation from expression. So we're going to treat expression um, as an average over the regulatory steady states. And finally, uh, we have to worry about what happens to the mRNA and we're going to treat, do another timescale separation and we're going to assume that the production and degradation of the mRNA and in balance. So that too is a steady state. Now, these are conventional assumptions that are typically always taken when we study uh, gene regulation, going back to the classical studies in bacteria and E. coli, which uh, Rob in particular is very familiar with. Um, and these, we're, we're inheriting these into this uh, uh, more complicated context of looking at, at eukaryotic gene regulation. And these foreground assumptions can be dispensed with, unlike the background assumptions, but at the expense, of course, of much complicating the, the models that we're dealing with. And, and, and also, uh, if you want to do that, I think the data that you need um, are, are, are also more elaborate to look at. Okay, so, so, so those are the sort of broad assumptions we're gonna make. And I want to, to move on to um, the particular approach that we've been taking um, to do this, which we call the linear framework. Um, so um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, so I, I'm going to sort of um, be rather brief here. And my apologies if um, some of this language is, um, is foreign and I, I go too fast. I don't think it, it's important to get into the details here because to, uh, to understand what I want to describe next. Um, so, but for the benefit of those who, who do want to see some of the working parts, um, let me say a little bit about this. So um, the linear framework is the best way to think about it, I, I think, is that it's a graph-based approach to doing Markov processes. Um, so let's think about the graph end of it. And, and the graph there is shown on the left of this diagram. Um, it's a graph illustrating uh, a gene, a single gene, uh, which um, is uh, uh, being affected by the input of, of a transcription factor that binds to two sites. Um, and we're representing in the vertices of the graph uh, what we call the microstates or mesostates, if you prefer, um, of, of the system, um, uh, the, the binding the, uh, of the transcription factor to to one or the other of the two sites, and also independently on its own site, the binding of RNA polymerase treated as an entity in its own right um, in, in magenta there. Um, so, so there are three sites and, and eight states, uh, uh, 16 states that are, that are coming out from this. Um, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, getting myself very confused here and can't actually count. Um, my apologies. There are precisely eight vertices there. Um, and the vertices rep represent these, um, these microstates of the system. Um, and the arrows, there are directed arrows between these, uh, these microstates. And these are uh, transitions. And the transitions are the obvious ones. They come from binding or unbinding of one or the other of these two ligands. Um, and these uh, directed edges have labels on them. And two of the labels are shown um, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this picture here. And these labels um, uh, have a rather complicated syntax because um, the, the, these represent the rates uh, of the transitions and, and these can depend on 
on the microstate, so don't, don't worry about the, the notation. The important thing to keep in mind here is that these labels, which are transition rates, they have dimensions of inverse time, uh, can be complicated because they, uh, they record the way in which the graph interacts with the system of which it's a part. So in particular, they contain concentration terms for things like the ligand, which is uh, square brackets L there, is the concentration of the, of the blue transcription factor that is involved in the binding. And it could be much more complicated depending on what else is present in the environment uh, uh, in which this graph is operating. So that's the graph. And how is this related to the Markov process? So the graph defines, if you like, the infinitesimal generator of the Markov process. So in the box at the top, um, we, we have uh, the language of Markov processes. There's a Markov process X and, and a Markov process is defined by conditional probabilities. And this is saying that the label on the edge is the infinitesimal uh, transition rate. That's what that piece of mathematics says. Um, and if you, um, if, you, if you start with that definition, then there's a way to generate from the graph um, the uh, master equation of the Markov process. And you do that through, through what's called the Laplacian matrix of the graph. And uh, let me not uh, get into too many of the details here. I'm very happy to spell this out at the end if anybody is interested, but you can go to the papers and, and read all this. I just wanted to sort of explain the graph and explain the connection to the Markov processes. And, and this representation, this relationship is one-to-one. -one. So given any of this, this labeled directed graph, we get a Markov process. And given any Markov process, which is well behaved in the sense that it has infinitesimal rates, um, I can describe it by graph. So, so these are equivalent um, ways of looking at things. Um, the graph has not been utilized much uh, to talk about Markov processes, but we have really come to to believe in it as a, as a very important aspect of understanding uh, how these Markov processes can be used in biology. Okay, so as I said, one of the assumptions we're making is that we're going to be treating systems, regulatory systems, at steady state. So to do that, I have to um, uh, treat the master equation uh, at steady state. So the left-hand side is zero. So we need um, uh, to find a vector um, which is um, going to, when multiplied into the Laplacian matrix, give zero. Uh, and a mathematician would describe this as saying the vector is in the kernel of the Laplacian matrix. Um, and there is a very beautiful formula for, for uh, generating uh, elements of the kernel. Um, and um, uh, the first thing you have to know is that um, if the graph is strongly connected, then basically it doesn't matter what initial conditions you use uh, to start the dynamics on the graph. Um, it basically always uh, converges to a, to a steady state that's unique um, in terms of probabilities, it's absolutely unique. Um, and uh, uh, strongly connected simply means that if you have any two vertices, they're connected by a path of edges in the same direction, um, uh, uh, no matter which pair of vertices you pick. So it's it's a it's a it's a it's an architectural constraint on on the graph. And in this case, um, the kernel of the Laplacian is one-dimensional. That's a, a restatement of the fact that it's um, a, a unique steady state. Um, and you can construct a, a basis element in this kernel um, using um, a, a theorem from graph theory that's called the matrix tree theorem. And it looks um, horrendous, but it's actually very straightforward. Um, and um, what that formula uh, is saying is that if I pick a vertex i and I want to know what the, um, the, uh, um, uh, the, this basis um, vector is for component i, um, I need to look at um, all the spanning trees of the graph that are rooted at microstate i. Now, what does that mean? So a spanning tree of the graph is a subgraph, which uh, is spanning, which means it, every vertex is on the tree. Um, and it's a tree, which means that if I forget the edge directions, there can't be any loops in it. Um, and it's rooted at microstate i, it means that microstate i is the only vertex from which there's no outgoing edge. And illustrated below for the graph on the previous slide, I've um, shown three examples of rooted spanning trees in the graph. And I, I, I show this 
merely to point out the uh, combinatorial complexity that's present here. Um, you can have a lot of spanning trees, and we'll come back to that point. Uh, but I just want to make uh, just um, make you aware of that. But it's it's straightforward in principle to find these spanning trees. Now, once you've found them, um, to 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 construct this component of the, of the the vector in the kernel, it's very straightforward. For each tree, you take all the labels on the tree, on the edges of the tree, you multiply them all together, that's the thing in, in, in brackets, and then you add this up over all the trees. That's it. And if you have an element of this uh, uh, steady state vector, this kernel vector, then to obtain the steady state probabilities is very straightforward. There's only one degree of freedom left, uh, which is the sort of total amount of uh, material in the graph, if you like, uh, uh, concentration in the graph, um, and you just normalize this ith component of the vector to the sum of all of the other components, and that's shown at the bottom. So this is a, is a way of calculating steady state probabilities, and this works for any graph. Now, what happens if the graph is at thermodynamic equilibrium? Now, that um, uh, I, um, said something miraculous happens at thermodynamic equilibrium, and in the context of, its, of the graph, we can see it um, uh, on this slide. So uh, for a graph, a linear framework graph, to be operating at thermodynamic equilibrium, first of all, um, the transitions from I, to, from I to J has to be reversible. Namely, uh, there must also be a transition from J to I, which is actually the reverse of that transition and not simply an alternative way of, of doing, going to the, those states. Um, and uh, moreover, um, each pair of reversible edges in the graph is sort of independently at equilibrium. And that's the formula in the middle there, uh, which is basically saying, if I take a pair of reversible edges between I and J, then the flux of probability from I to J is balanced by the flux of probability from J to I. It's as if all the other components, uh, vertices in the graph are not present. Um, it's as if the graph disintegrates into pairs of reversible edges. And this is what I mean when, to a mathematician, this uh, property of detail balance really seems amazing. And it has very, very strong consequences because it means we can actually give a different description to, um, uh, uh, we can construct a different basis element in the kernel um, of the Laplacian. So it's an alternative way of, 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 of calculating probabilities and what do you have to do if you want to calculate uh, this alternative vector? You just take any path to I from some reference vertex, which we'll call one, and you just take the product of the label ratios along the path. That's the formula at the bottom. And here's the thing, detail balance implies that this number that you get doesn't depend on the path you took. And this is precisely what we meant by path independence when we were talking about Hopfield's calculation. And what you can see from this is that at equilibrium, you have this uh, property of path independence. But if we go back a slide and look at what the matrix tree tells us, tree, tree theorem tells us, away from equilibrium, uh, all that um, uh, breaks down. There's, there's absolutely no path independence. You have to worry about all paths. It's even worse than, you know, you, you, it matters which part you take. Not only does it matter, you have to take all of them into consideration, and the matrix tree theorem is a way of organizing the, the bookkeeping, the accounting for that calculation. Okay. All right. So uh, I let's um, uh, let me just say very briefly that there's a lot of historical background to what I've been talking about here, but let me skip over this in the interest of time and move on to uh, tell you something about um, uh, what the point of all this is. Um, and, and to talk about um, this particular problem of sharpness. So we're gonna look at gene regulation and gene regulation functions. Um, and uh, uh, I remind you of this particular example that we took uh, looked at before uh, of um, hunchback uh, responding to Bitcoin as an example. So we're gonna look at um, uh, input output gene regulation functions in which there's a single input, a single transcription factor and, and the output of a single gene. Um, and uh, we're going to quantify sharpness. How do you quantify sharpness? Well, people do it in lots of ways. Uh, they fit Hill functions. Uh, they uh, construct various kinds of measures. The, the single most important thing that I would say here is that you need to have two measures of, of what sharpness means. Sharpness is about the shape of a function, and function shapes can be very complicated. And trying to capture sharpness with one number is a really bad idea. 
So we capture it with two, and the particular two that we use are illustrated here. So we start with the function f of x, um, and we assume its, its output is normalized, so it's going between one and zero. We just divide by its maximum value. Um, and then we normalize the independent variable, and we do that by um, just basically um, uh, normalizing to the half maximal value. Um, and that's in fact exactly what was done for the experimental data that we're showing there for Hunchback Bitcoin. And having got this normalized uh, on, on both the independent and the dependent variable, um, uh, value, we measure sharpness by looking at the derivative, that's the red curve, and taking the maximum of the derivative, that's what we call steepness, and the, uh, the coordinate at which that um, maximum value is attained, which we call, and this was a really stupid choice, position, unfortunately. Okay, so we're going to look at position and steepness. Okay, so what I'm going to show you on this slide here are position steepness plots. Um, and uh, we're coming back here to, to Hunchback and, and Bicoid, and I'm showing you a combination of several things on the big plots on the left there. Um, so this is um, um, a, a plot of, of position, normalized position on, on the bottom and, uh, and steepness uh, um, on the y-axis. Um, and, and there are several things um, in this. Let me begin with the blue curve that you see uh, going through that. Um, that is the locus of position steepness for the hill functions. And the hill functions uh, are, are that class of functions illustrated on the upper left there. Uh, I'm sure most of you will know about them. Um, and the crosses and uh, numbers that are marked on that are the integer hill coefficient values. So when little h has the values, uh, the integer values shown there. And that, that's, a, that's a nice navigational tool in these position steepness plots because the hill function is often used uh, to fit uh, to, to, to get a measure of, uh, of, of sharpness, okay? And that's how it lies in position steepness space. All right, um, now the gray area um, are the position steepness um, um, values for um, gene regulation functions that we've calculated from models uh, for uh, six transcription factor binding sites. Um, and you can see that it has a very sort of distinctive shape. It has this sort of cusp that you can't see it quite so well because it's obscured by other material, um, but that cusp is just um, underneath the hill coefficient with um, hill coefficient, uh, the hill function with coefficient six. I'm going to come back to talking about this region in a, in, a, in the next few slides, but um, let let me talk about the thing that's important here, which is the experimental data, and what we're seeing there are position steepness plots for um, two. Um, uh, different uh, versions of the gene. The first is the wild type hunchback gene uh, from what's called the P2 enhancer. Um, and um, uh, every dot that you see there is from one embryo in which we've uh, um, uh, extricated uh, the, uh, the uh, imaging data um, and averaged suitably over the embryo. And we've got uh, um, a measure, the same kind of gene regulation function that we saw previously, and we've calculated, estimated the position steepness. And you can see they cluster around the average, which is the, the uh, colored dot in the middle. And it's awfully close, in fact, to uh, a hill function with um, um, uh, coefficient six there. Now also shown is um, a, a, a synthetic enhancer, which uh, whose structure is shown at the bottom, in which um, only the binding sites for bicoid are, are present, as far as we know, all of the intervening DNA outside certain binding uh, motifs has been randomized. So to the best of our knowledge, none of the other things which are known to bind in the P2 enhancer are actually binding there. Um, and you get another cluster of points around there. Now, the thing to, uh, to that, that's very obvious here is that, um, these, these points, whether for the wild type or the synthetic um, uh, enhancer, really don't lie inside the equilibrium region. And, and that's really the, 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 one of the thrusts of what I'm trying to say here. Um, now, it's a little equivocal because some do and some don't. Um, but, uh, but now, if you go to the, to the plot on the right, um, that is showing um, the same synthetic enhancer with the first three sites from the left deleted. Um, and, the, and the corresponding region uh, equilibrium region is the black dashed line. Um, and the data points for, for this enhancer, as you see, are, are really very well away from this region. So 
the uh, the implication here is that we cannot account for this data um, with a, a model uh, for, of gene regulation um, uh, which is at thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, now, now I want to get into the issue of what is this region? Um, because, um, uh, because in order to, to assess the statement I just made, you really need to know what this region is. So when we started... Um, um, sorry, it's Rob. I just wanted to alert you, uh, 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left, Rob, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that and I'll, 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 I'll try to keep to that. Um, so, um, so, so what we see here are, are two of our early attempts to try um, um, uh, two of our early attempts to to identify these regions um, using two different kinds of, of, of graph. The first uh, is a graph that just involves binding of a transcription factor, this time with three sites. Um, and the problem here is how do you then assess what the um, the, the gene uh, the output is um, and um, uh, we made uh, certain assumptions, uh, we, which gives rise uh, in on the right hand side to the region shown in uh, in yellow, um, if you can make it out on the slide. Now, sometime later, uh, we adopted what I think was a better strategy for, for defining um, the uh, gene regulation function, which is to introduce polymerase as an aspect of the model shown here in magenta. And, and then the output is simply the probability that um, that polymerase is, is bound. Um, then um, if you do that, you get the gray region, which is in fact what I showed you on the previous slide. Um, now, so, so, so for any choice of model, we can, we can map these regions out, that's not difficult. But the problem is, um, how do you assess what this is telling you? Because the model that I've shown, either of the models, uh, merely represent a, a tiny amount of the detail that is there. One could argue, well, suppose the model had, um, you know, we were to include the role of chromatin of nucleosomes or mediator, we would get a much more complicated model and then who knows what the region would look like. So what I wanted to, to tell you about, and uh, let me see if I can get through this without um, being entirely confusing, is that in fact, um, there is a universal region um, and um, um, uh, let me let me try and unwrap um, the theorem here. Um, so so what this uh, um, is saying is imagine that we had a graph that was describing the complexity of, of gene regulation here, um, and it allowed for all the things that I've just talked about. It allowed for um, the presence of mediator. It allowed for chromatin. It allowed for the fact that. Um, a mediator could have multiple conformations. Uh, it could uh, it would allow for any of the other um, factors that are involved to have their own conformations, um, and it could have many many ligands, including the one of interest, but also many others which were binding at their own sites, um, and um, they could bind in such a way that the affinity of binding, the uh, the rates. Um, would depend on the conformation and the pattern of binding of any other ligands and basically uh, more or less um, uh, arbitrary uh, um, uh, uh, complexity subject uh, to the fact that this is all happening at thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, then uh, uh, no matter how you define the output of the system, and it, so the output could depend not only on the ligand of interest, which I call ligand K here, um, but also on um, the conformation state of mediator or the presence or not of a nucleosome or whatever assumptions you want to make. Um, then um, the position steepness of this function um, lies within a bounded region. Um, uh, which doesn't depend, this, the, the, the shape of this region doesn't depend on the parameter values. Um, uh, it's an asymptotic region. Um, and this region has a cusp which lies on this uh, curve of, of hill functions um, and it approaches the position steepness of the hill function whose hill coefficient is the number of binding sites for that particular ligand. So, if you accept this, which I, 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 I realize must sound a little bit extraordinary, but if you accept this result, then it, play, then it puts the previous um, uh, results in a, in a different light. Now, I'm not showing you this uh, universal region because we're still in the process of trying to fine tune the numerics to obtain it, but it is very similar to the one in the bottom right-hand plot uh, for various reasons, which I won't go into. Um, and, um, and 
if in fact there is a universal region here, then whether or not um, the, the experimental data lies in it, if the experimental data really doesn't lie in it, um, as seems to be the case for three deletions there, then it's a very compelling statement that this system cannot be uh, explained at thermodynamic equilibrium because it doesn't matter how complicated the model is. If it's at thermodynamic equilibrium, it can't account for the data. And this is not a matter of fitting, it's a matter of mathematics. So we believe um, that there's a, a very compelling statement here that this, um, uh, this data can't be accounted for with the regulatory system at thermodynamic equilibrium. And just to finish up the implications of that, and I think this was a question that came up earlier, um, uh, what I haven't said and what I haven't given you any data for is that if in fact um, you are away from thermodynamic equilibrium, if you expend energy, then this region can be broken. And, and you can get much higher Hill coefficients with the same number of binding sites. So what that is saying is precisely that the Hill function is the Hopfield barrier for sharpness. So the Hill function, which used to be just a sort of fit um, to data, uh, is now being um, uh, reinterpreted in, in this biophysical sense. It's a, it's a universal um, barrier, Hopfield barrier for, for binding. All right, so, um, so uh, I was going to tell you something about how this comes about. It sounds like a really amazing result. How can you deal with any old graph? And it's through a, 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 a process that we worked out recently, a systematic process of what's called coarse graining. Um, and I won't go into this. It's a very powerful method precisely because it allows us to say things about arbitrary graphs. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into this. Um, so you'll forgive me if I don't, but um, the, the paper that's discussing it should be coming out soon. Um, and um, I was also going to say something about the experimental difficulties of detecting energy dissipation, which is the next part of this, because it's all very well to come up with theory that says, you know, there's no way we can explain this at equilibrium, but if it's really away from equilibrium, how on earth are we going to detect that? And there's some very important challenges there, both conceptually, but also at the experimental level of, of technique. Um, and finally, I was going to tell you something about um, some of the really difficult um, challenges at thermodynamic equilibrium uh, when you're away from thermodynamic equilibrium. But again, for reasons of time, I'm going to have to skip over this. Um, and um, uh, 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 let me just end with a summary, um, really. Um, so following the energy for us has really become a sort of strategy for rethinking aspects of molecular biology and cell biology from this perspective and the information processing aspects of it specifically. Um, and I, I think it offers us a systematic way to sort of ask questions and develop um, answers. Um, and um, this idea of Hopfield barriers, I think, is a very nice way to, um, to, to articulate this. Um, I've shown you one Hopfield barrier. We think there are many more, and I think it would be fun to try and identify that. Um, I think there are some very deep challenges, both experimentally and in non-equilibrium physics, to to take that program forward. I think we can. We've, there's some progress that's been made, and I, and I think ultimately what this gives us is a sort of foundation for understanding biology, which um, uh, we've been trying to get our hands on, and I think this offers us a way to do it. Okay, so I'm sorry for having to skip part of that, but I think uh, in the interests of time, let me uh, finish by, by saying a special thank you to my department colleague, Angela de Pace, um, who I've worked with over many years, and, and it was the conversations between Angela and me who, which led to many of the ideas that we've talked about, and particularly um, the, the data that I show, which was acquired by her postdoc, Jihei Park, um, uh, uh, the, uh, we, which I showed on, on the slides there. Um, and finally, um, um, I'll just leave you with um, my lab, uh, people I work with, and, and a group of wonderful undergraduate students who over the years have helped develop the linear framework. So I'm sorry, very sorry, if I exceeded my time there. But um, uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, I hope I can address them. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. That's great. Thanks, Jeremy. So we have time for some questions. If people, you know, please, please feel free to put them uh, on uh, on the Q and A section. And I'm gonna try to. There's a bunch. I'm gonna try to go through go through them. You know, hopefully, yeah. I guess we'll figure it out as we go. Um, I guess one question that touches on the beginning of the talk on the pathetic thinking that that different people are asking. Uh, maybe 
one of the one of the, impl the implementations of that question is by Session Chang saying, asking, could you elaborate again how to get the graph uh, a priori? Do you just observe all the microstates that can happen in reg in regulating the gene and not their casual connections? And this is one of of uh, a few questions that I've seen that are related to, for example, um, how do you explain the reversibility of these reactions uh, in the context of transcription if transcription is an irreversible process once you uh, initiate transcription? Um, uh, thanks, Anan. So um, uh, uh, let me see if I can and address the, the first question. So, so I think uh, if I understand, you know, how do you come up with the the choice of of microstates and things. I think that's the perennial question of, you know, how do you model? What do you put in and what do you put out, leave out? Um, and I think that's very much uh, a matter of um, what do you think is important for the question being being asked? And perhaps I should say that um, uh, in the context of the, 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 the paper I referred to, the review paper about, um, you know, pathetic assumptions in modeling, um, uh, I think one of the qu consequences of that way of thinking is, um, uh, for me, uh, has been um, that we should develop models to answer questions. Um, so so uh, I think in physics we have this idea that we make a model and, and that's it, it describes reality and we can keep coming back to it and asking questions and it'll give us the right answers and we have prediction, predictive capability and, and that's true in physics and engineering. Um, but I'm not sure it's true in biology and I, I think uh, I feel more comfortable with treating models uh, 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 as uh, as things that we make to answer particular questions. Um, and uh, it, it, they're not standalone objects that we can then ask some other question. I mean, we might be lucky, but most of the time they're not because we haven't assumed the right thing. So the assumptions we make, I think, have to match the questions we're asking. And they're based on, you know, do, you, do we think that that's relevant for this question? And if not, leave it out. If yes, leave it in and see what happens. And, and, and then if we can come out from that with uh, a suggestion um, as to what's going on, and, and then we have to go back and see if that, that works. That's the go back to experiment. So I hope that that's an answer to the first question. Um, um, so, so, so the second question that Hanan mentioned had to do with this issue of reversibility. And um, I, I'm sorry if I didn't clarify this, but um, uh, I, 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 I was saying earlier that um, uh, in, in this discussion, I'm trying to keep very separate what I call regulation from, um, from expression. Um, and you're absolutely right that, that the moment you start thinking about expression, um, well, of course, you know, polymerase is uh, operating very far from thermodynamic equilibrium. It's definitely irreversible. Um, you know, it turns DNA into mRNA, it doesn't turn mRNA into DNA. Um, so, so once you start talking about expression, you are fundamentally away from equilibrium and, and indeed irreversible. But when you're talking about regulation, um, that's not so clear uh, because um, many of the processes that take place in regulation, binding, unbinding, chromatin, remodeling, and uh, movement of nuclei are potentially reversible. And, and even um, uh, those uh, mechanisms which are expending energy, like for instance, phosphorylation, um, are reversible in the sense that they are processes that will put phosphate groups, um, take phosphate groups off. Um, and if you get into the, the, the nitty gritty of it, even uh, the, the kinases uh, can operate uh, reversibly under certain circumstances. So um, indeed, some of those uh, processes that are at work under physiological conditions uh, have to be considered irreversible. Um, and if they are irreversible, then uh, for sure that system is operating away from equilibrium. They're, 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 not, um, they're not at thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, so uh, the, the, the models that I uh, considered in, in the context of, of this talk um, were all um, uh, assuming reversible um, uh, uh, binding and unbinding reactions, for instance. So, so I hope that was an answer to the question. Great, thanks. There's another set of questions that are also somehow related. One is, if energy expenditure drives um, yeah, if energy expenditure drives fidelity, are high fidelity processes more energy intense? And, and related to this, is, is there an analogy between stiffness and position, between the stiffness and position trade off and the accuracy and speed trade off, I guess, of the more classic um, Hopfield example? 
Okay, so um, uh, does uh, the uh, fidelity depend on the uh, the uh, uh, amount of energy ex being expended? Um, I think uh, you, you would say yes, uh, based on the uh, kind of analysis that, that, that Hopfield carried out. Um, and you can make that more explicit by actually um, uh, tracking um, the, the rate of energy expenditure and relating that to the, the improvement um, in the um, in the uh, in the error rate, uh, but it's uh, much more uh, uh, subtle uh, than than that. Um, and even in Hopfield's original situation, um, uh, in order to get the uh, improvement uh, in in fidelity, um, uh, the improvement in the error ratio beyond equilibrium, um, Hopfield uh, found this uh, beautiful set of three parametric conditions, which guarantees that. Um, but if uh, those parametric conditions are not met, uh, things can get uh, much worse. Not only could you not, uh, you, you could actually expend energy um, and your error ratio could be worse than it was at equilibrium. Um, and so one of the things I was going to talk about but, but didn't have an opportunity is that actually um, the, the, the sort of landscape of being away from equilibrium um, is, 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 is very, is very nuanced. It's not just about the fact that you're away from equilibrium, it's how you are away from equilibrium, where you are expending energy in the context of the architecture of a graph. Um, and um, the, the parametric dependence on all the other things um, that are going on in the graph. Um, uh, and, and you can do it in such a way as to, to, to improve the information and processing you're doing, but you can do it in such a way that you make the information processing even worse than it would have been at equilibrium. Jeremy, uh, I'm going to I'm going to step in and ask a, a question which has to do with experiments. And you know, I'm well aware of the things you've been doing with Angela. And I guess what I'm curious about is, you know, I think you might remember when we had our really small meeting. We uh, we we ended with our dream. You know, what each of us dreamed of as being like the killer experiment that we're missing. And so I guess what I'm curious about because I think this is such an important class of questions is. You know, if if one went to the trouble of spending a few years designing the right experiment, first of all, would it be in the context of transcription or something else? And um, and then, you know, what are the elements of that experiment? What are the knobs that you think need to be tuned, both as a theorist and as an experimentalist? And um, well, I don't know. And then should we do it? <laughs> yeah. No. Great question, Rob. And. Um... So, so I think, um, you know, for us, uh, Angela and me, and um, I think transcription has really been uh, at the heart of this, um, uh, our thinking. Um, it's not to say that I don't think there are other aspects of information processing where the issues that we've discussed um, are very relevant. But I think transcription um, is particularly nice because we have, you know, the data where we can make um, you know, uh, I, I think a compelling case that it's actually operational in this context that, you know, for this gene hunchback in respect of this upstream transcription factor, Bicoid, um, we think that there really is energy expenditure that is responsible for creating the observed sharpness. Now, uh, for us, trying to show that experimentally is a major, is a major goal. And, um, and, and so I would think um, the, the kind of experiment that one would love to be able to do um, is basically um, check to see if there's an arrow of time. I mean, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could, uh, you know, uh, uh, make an anoscopic drone that would just uh, watch um, the, the even some mesoscopic changes of state at the at the regulatory system, um, and, and give us a movie of what's going on there, what's binding, what's unbinding, what's flopping around, um, and you know, we just do the statistics on that forward and backwards, and uh, you know, if we can see a difference. It ain't at equilibrium. Uh, and to me, that is the dream experiment. And the problem is uh, we don't know how to do that because um, we have single molecule capability now. We, we, can, we can watch individual transcription factors bind and unbind, even at individual loci, loci in, in uh, systems like Drosophila. It hasn't been done in Drosophila, I think, but, but we could do it. Um, but that's just uh, that transcription factor. Um, and is that enough of the mesoscopic state to be able to capture uh, what's going on? Because it's, I think it's very easy to see that if you coarse grain, and, and here we come to something that uh, we were, I was going to discuss but didn't have a chance, we're always coarse graining. And, and 
if you have a system that is away from equilibrium at a detail level, it's very easy to see that you can coarse grain it into something that looks as if it's at equilibrium. Right. Um, I think if you coarse grain it and it's away from equilibrium, then for sure it couldn't have been at equilibrium at a more detailed level. Yeah. Um, but but coarse graining is always going to destroy the chances that you can you can see the dissipation of energy. And for us, that's the critical issue. How yeah. detailed do we have to be in the context of this gene? Uh, what do we need to look for? And I think the single molecule experiments are just starting to get to the point where we are beginning to feel that we might have enough to be able to do this experiment. All right, cool. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I noticed you have a picture of Matt Thompson uh, there. And so for those of you that don't know, Matt, Matt was actually, uh, after he finished his undergrad, he worked with Jeremy, I think for three years. But I was going to say, interestingly, that, you know, the active matter systems that uh, Matt has been working on, there's the opportunity to actually measure what's going on with ATP consumption. Um, I think we're going to call it quits for today. There were a lot more questions. I see uh, actually tomorrow's speaker is, is here, Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz. And um, you know, I hope that uh, today you got a taste of at least the, the concept of how this next uh, three weeks is going to work. We are delighted for you uh, to join us. And um, I want to just give another big, huge thank you to Jeremy. It's so great to see you. And I look forward to seeing you in real life and many of you, the rest of you in real life soon. And um, wish you all a great day and health and happiness. Rob, right. thanks a lot. That was great to see thanks, you. Thanks, Jeremy. And um, great to see you guys. And okay. just uh, for the ones, the ones that are still here, we'll make the talk available online on the course website. And if anyone has any f uh, questions that they didn't get a chance to ask, don't hesitate to drop me an email. Um, it's all on the slides. Yeah. Okay. Hey guys. Bye everybody.